and my dear participants today's topic is very interesting uh, it is about the evolution of the valvular heart disease the, this big first chapter i think dr kobir jaman sir is the associate professor and senior consultant of national heart foundation is the right person to talk about this topic uh, i think professor wadu sir please comment on this topic and kobir jaman sir Assalamualaikum and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, before we start, uh, I will ask everybody to pray for one of our senior colleagues and teacher and ex-director of NSPT, Professor Abu Hussein Khan Choudhury, who is on ventilator from COVID pneumonia and relax complications. Please pray for him and for also for all those who have departed from us and those who already were infected. Let us all together pray for their quick recovery. Uh, about the subject valvular heart disease well the determination of existence the severity the prognosis the treatment modality all of these uh, aspects of valvular heart disease depend principally upon the echo findings along with the clinical presentation now professor kamru chaman uh, i have been lucky to have him as my colleague and i know him from his student time uh, the young stars who do not know him, you should follow him. His determination and enthusiasm and perseverance facing the adverse condition when he started his career, when he went to India for further training. That's a story that needs to be told again and again. And today, he's at his present position by his sincerity, by his excellence, and by the sheer dint of his hard work, they should inspire us all. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Kobri Jamal. Sir, over to you. Thank you, sir, Professor Wadu, for so much, so so. so much. Please mute everybody except the speaker. Sir, I have muted, sir. Right. Respected teachers and the course directors and the distinguished audience, I will talk few words regarding the cardiographic evaluation of the valvular heart disease. It's a vast chapter. I will want to, I will try to make it palatable and I, I will try to make it coincide. <clears throat> I have seen Professor Nozul Islam sir and Professor Jala sir is in the screen. So I am giving the due respect and salam to my teachers. I am studying it. I am feeling some sort of palpitation in my heart in front of such and, and big giants and legends of legends in Cardinals. So thank you, sir. Slavakum. So, echocardiographic evaluation of the valvular heart disease. Now, what is the normal valve function? Actually, it means the maintain, normal valves are those that maintain the forward flow and prevent reversal of flow. And valves open and close in response to pressure differences between the cardiac chambers. Now, what is mean by valve stenosis? Actually, it is the obstruction to valve flow during that phase of the cardiac cycle when the valve is normally open. Hemodynamically, hallmark is the pressure gradient across the valve. Now the valve regurgitation, insufficiency, incompetence, it is means the inadequate valve closure and back leakage. And hemodynamic hallmark is the volume, regurgitated volume. So a single valve can be both stenotic and regurgitant, but importantly, both lesions cannot be severe. So this is the sequelae of the valvular heart disease. As for example, mitral valve may be, there may be mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, or mixed of mitral stenosis and regurgitation. And same also for all other these valves. Here I will just talk about the stenosis and regurgitation, not the mixed valve disease. So I'll talk a few words regarding the mitral stenosis. 
what does it mean an obstruction to blood flow between left atrium and the left ventricle as caused by the abnormal mitral valve function so this is the normal valve these i will talk just few like highlight some important etiology causes of congenital and acquired heart disease that induces the mitral stenosis i don't go details because echocardiography uh, etiological diagnosis is the part of echocardiography so these are the second acquired causes of mitral stenosis rheumatic heart disease is most prevalent and these least is the congenital heart diseases that lead to mitral valve stenotic gradient and obstruction among these i will highlight just supraval mitral ring typical congenital mitral stenosis of this part of the mitral valve and parachute mitral valve so what is mean by supraval mitral ring it is a self like partial or incomplete ring composed of connective tissue located immediately above the mitral valve and it has central orifice of variable size and this is the schematic schematic diagram showing the supraval mitral ring and you can see this is the personal law axis modified view showing you the supraval mitral ring or membrane there is some history this patient was came from silent and he was sent to me for evaluation of the ptmc thinking that he had the rheumatic heart disease actually the valve have the characteristics and movement like rheumatic heart disease but one exceptional thing is that the both the valves move very freely in contradiction to rheumatic heart disease while posterior mitral lip is remain immobile and see the next picture this is the scenario you can see the valves look taken but there is supraval mitral membrane that looks like and there is looks like diastolic booming but the both the leaflets moves very smartly and freely that is the distinguishing point for the rheumatic heart disease and the supraval mitral ring another thing is when we pull to the color flow so this is the typical congenital mitral stenosis i am just mentioning it i have not seen this case in my life but many of the report in my practical life i have seen that they mention it as the congenital mitral stenosis actually they want to mean the parachute mitral valve or double orifice mitral valve like this so this is uh, entirely different and the all the valve leaflets get involved in this congenital heart disease now in the parachute mitral valve it is frequently talked in the viva ball and clinical discussion what is the characteristic maybe insert into on papillary muscle as the is the main pathological feature and you can see the lines is being showing the dome on the thickening of the leaflet of mitral leaflet and this is a single papillary muscle and there is other things in some patients with parachute mitral valve there is aberrant disposition of the papillary muscles and found located at the lb apex and you can see this is the single papillary muscle located in the lb apex and the cordy and the leaflets are inserted to the single papillary muscle you can see the scenario the single papillary muscle taking or insertion from both leaflets and this is the fourth chamber view of the same patients high velocity las in color flow jets that was the stenotic stenotic bulb and this is the continuous wave doppler gradient and meaning that is the severe gradient so this is a picture of greek mythology one is the echo she is the symbol of sound and she is the narcissus is the symbol of image now i will we, we are talking about the echocardiography evaluation of the mitral stenosis so role of main imaging of the stool for one is determination of the severity of the mitral stenosis another to determine the etiology of the disease now regarding 2d echocardiography what are the features we can get uh, or information we can have from the 2d images for the in favor of mitral stenosis we can see the morphology of the mitral valve apparatus we can measure the mb orifice area we can measure the mb annulus la dimension thrombus in la lv and rv systolic function so in rheumatic heart disease these are the characteristic features 
these are the characteristic features of the mitral valve leaflets or mitral valve apparatus. There is thickening at the leaflet edges. There is fusion of the commissures, product shortening and fusion, and calcification. Importantly, for mitral stenosis, there is predominant fusion of the commissure. And there is diastolic doming and systolic symmetric fusion of the commissure. So I'm showing you, this is the still frame of parasternal law axis, showing the thickening of the both leaflets, dilatation of the LA, and there is the doming of the anterior mitral leaflet, someone at level as an hockey stick appearance of the mitral leaflet. And this is the signal loop of the mitral rheumatic heart disease leading to mitral stenosis. You can see there is restrictive movement of the both leaflets, there is thickening of the both leaflets, and PML is in white. And there is some two to three grade of subvalvular thickening. And valves are pliable, no remarkable classification. These are the suitable images extending from the leaflet up to the papillary muscles. See, this thickening is a great three to four. This is the papillary muscles. And you can see the a loop of short axis. You can see there is symmetrical fusion of the commission. The leaflet looks thickened and there is restriction of the diastolic opening. No remarkable classification. This is the apical four chamber view showing the typical color flow imaging of the severe mitral stenosis and that there is dilated LA. This Wil Wilson score, it is designed to describe the, all the component, abnormal component of this uh, bulk leaflet, leaflet thickening, mobility, subvalvular apparatus, and But they do not uh, mention any, you have to read it. So how can we make the mitral valve orifice area by planimetry? So it is the most useful descriptor in the mitral valve orifice area. And you have to, when you use the 2D or 3D images, particularly the 2D echocardiography, then you have to start the imaging plan in short axis view at the level of the papillary muscle and very really slowly sweep towards the mitral valve, towards the deep level of the mitral valve. And whenever you get these type of emails, freeze it and uh, take the measurement. Mind it, if you go further towards the LA, inside the LA, then the posterior wall will be lost. So whenever if the image will show you the both anterior and posterior leaflet, posterior wall of the mitral valve area, then it, it will, you will uh, keep in mind that the, you are in correct position. Now, you by planimetry, you can measure the mitral valve area. Here is 0 0.7 millimeter, 0 0.7 square centimeter. So it is the severe mitral stenosis. So this is the 3D image showing again the mit severe mitral stenosis. And these are the parameters of mild, moderate, severe regarding the mitral valve area. More than 1.5 it is mild but less than 1.0 uh, 1 is the severe mitral stenosis. Now you have to measure the left atrial dimension because LA become dilated in mitral stenosis and take measurement in two orthogonal plan. In our institute, we take actually one measurement per external law axis and another measurement in the apical four chamber view in the transverse plan. It is usually requirement of the surgeons, they try to uh, find uh, is there any need for reduction of the LSI's DV size? Now the mitral valve annulus measurement. There uh, again, you have to measure in two orthogonal plan. One is the four chamber view, another is a two chamber view. This is the normal mitral valve annulus size, and you have to measure the mitral valve annulus in this position from hinge point to hinge point in mid diastole. Now you have to look for the electrons, but before uh, looking for electrombus, you have to be sure of there's some normal structure in the left atrial appendage. These are the pectinate muscle in the left atrial appendage. These are the normal structure, not the appendage, not the thrombus. And this is the loop of the thrombus. And you can see the severe spontaneous contrast in severe mitral stenosis. And you can see the skinny movie, the bulb of thrombus, and very beautifully displayed the subvalvular thickening or 
and even there is fusion. When but there is fusion of the subbulbular quarry, then these are very unsuitable, not suitable for PTFC. And this is another uh, cine movie pursuing the ball valve thrombus. So you have to evaluate next the left and right ventricular systolic function. In mitral stenosis, whenever there is F with first ventricular rate, then there may be an LB and RB systolic dysfunction due to tachyarrhythmia. So now the MOD echocardiography, what are the parameters you can evaluate by MOD? Actually, EF slope is of more historical than clinical value now today, and not mentioned as diagnostic criteria in recent guidelines. So from this is the M mode of the mitral valve of rheumatic heart disease. You can see the thickening of the AML and PML, and there is anterior motion of the PML, and this is the EF slope that is reduced. And these are the figures that may uh, mention you, normal EF slope is more than 80, but EF slope less than 15 means the valve area 1.3, but not practiced nowadays. Now Doppler echo for evaluation of the mitral stenosis. So we can use the color Doppler flow characteristics. We get to find out mean and peak transmital pressure gradient, including the VTI. We can find out the Doppler pressure half time and valve area. We can measure the pulmonary pressure and coexisting mitral valve regurgitation. So this is the classical picture of the uh, color flow image of the severe mitral stenosis. The high velocity aliasing flow across the mitral valve orifice. Now continuous safe Doppler. So this is the single most important factor in the determining the physiologic significance of the mitral stenosis. And you have to put continuous safe Doppler allow parallel to the mitral stenotic flow image. And you will get the image like this. This is the continuous wave Doppler, spectral Doppler image across the stenotic mitral valve. And it will give you, after tracing, you will find the velocity, the peak gradient and mean gradient, and also the heart rate. Remember, for each and every heart, uh, valvular heart diseases, whenever you are to mention the gradient, you are also to mention the heart rate. Because all the guidelines, they have mentioned the uh, gradient in respect to the normal heart rate. That is, in, uh, in heart rate 60 to 100. Whenever there is Tachycardia, you have to mention it in, in your report. And whenever there is bradycardia, then also you have to mention it in your, in your eco report. So these are the parameters of by gradient wise. The gradient more than less than five is mild gradient and more than 10 millimeter mercury. It is a severe stenotic gradient that goes the mitral valve. Regarding the pitch up time, this is the definition. Again, you have to apply the continuous Doppler image, Doppler technique and you will find out this type of image. Then there is software in the machine and you have to put the cursor and it will tell you that pressure half time, in this case it is 302, and this, at this pressure half time, the valve is 0.7. It's a calculated, calculated method. Now for your calculation of the pulmonary systolic pressure and PME in pressure, this is a very important part of evaluation of the mitral stenosis. So how do can we calculate the PSP? With PSP is equal to RB pressure and plus RA pressure. And this is validated in the absence of RBOT obstruction and pulmonary stenosis. So in doing so, you have to put continuous Doppler along the tricuspid regurgitant jet flow, and then you'll get this type of image, spectral Doppler image of tricuspid regurgitation, put and take and peak, peak uh, pressure gradient of the tricuspid regurgitation. Here it is 105, and you have to add RA pressure with it. Assuming that the RA pressure would be 10, then the PSP will 115. Very high PA pressure, severe pulmonary hypertension. And these are the table that showing how can we uh, measure the RA pressure. This is the normal pressure of RA, average 3, intermediate pressure, high pressure 15. And you have to evaluate two variables. One is the IVC diameter. Another is collapse of the IVC with sleep. I will not go details to this. And these are the parameters of mild, moderate, severe pulmonary hypertension. And how to measure the mean pulmonary artery pressure? You have to measure it from pulmonary regurgitation flow. And again, you have to put the continuous Doppler along the pulmonary regurgitation flow. 
and we will get these type of emails and then put and uh, you, you have to take the peak early diastolic pressure gradient. And with this pressure gradient, you have to add the RA pressure and you get the mean pulmonary artery pressure. So there are various methods for calculation of the mitral valve area in mitral stenosis. They are one of these, the planimetry, we have talked about it. A pressure of time, we have described it. Other two are the continuity equation and proximal isovelocity surface area. These two methods are cumbersome, not routinely used or practiced in real life. So I will skip the discussion of these two methods. Those who are interested, they can see this in the code and study it. The metal valve has difficult geometric shape that so these studies could not be done for them. Now about the stress echocardiography. Yes, stress echocardiography can unmask the symptom of mild mitral stenosis. And it, it excludes the discrepancy between the resting Doppler and clinical findings. And mean gradient more than 15 millimeter mercury is severe for exercise stress echo. And a PSP of more than 60 millimeter mercury on exercise is an indication for PTMC. Now, trans esophageal echo in mitral stenosis. So, it is to exclude the LA or LA appendix thrombus before PDMC and to guide the transeptal puncture or for positioning of the balloon during PDMC. Now, role of 3D echo, obviously, it is superior to 2D echo in many aspects. It's the higher accuracy than the 2D echo, and you can get detailed information of the commercial fusion and subvalvular involvement. And mitral valve area measurement in calcified and irregular valve is convenient. A mitral valve area measurement is more after balloon mitral valvotomy. So, role of echo during PTMC. It guides the transceptal puncture, helps in detecting acute complications like atrial or ventricular perforation with temporary, acute mitral regurgitation, valvular disruption. And you can have an assessment of the valve area after PTMC with Perimetry is the ideal. Pressure half time should not be used. So these are the parameters of severe mitral stenosis, but specific parameter is the bulb area. And this mean gradient and pulmonary artery pressure, these are the supportive findings. These are the tables showing mild, moderate, severe parameter of severe mitral, of mitral stenosis. I will not go details to this. This is the staging of the mitral stenosis. I will not go details to this. So you have the, all the parameters in your hand to decide about the mild, moderate, severe. So comment about the mild, moderate, severe mitral stenosis and if you like the staging. But in our clinical life scenario practice, we usually still use this school of thought still now. Now regarding the symptom, asymptomatic severe and symptomatic severe, I want to comment that the severity of the bulbule lesion is the echocardiographic diagnosis and it is, uh, it is done according to the echocardiographic criteria, but symptomatic or asymptomatic, that needs the clinical correlation. So after the end of the echo study, you have to comment on this in your reports. These are the factors you have to comment in your report. Etiology of the bulb, severity of the mitral stenosis, concomitant other valve lesions, size of LA, PSP, LVR, RV systolic function, mention about LA thrombus found or not, comment on suitability of the PTMC if needed. Now, this is the end of the mitral stenosis. Now, I will switch on to the mitral regurgitation. So, mitral valve incompetence with systolic regurgitation of the valve from left ventricle to left atrium. This is the definition of the mitral regurgitation. This is the mitral regurgitation. And this is the picture, diagrammatic picture, showing the different parts of the valve. Mitral valve apparatus, annulus, leaflet, cordy, and papillary vas. And this is the normal four chamber view of the normal heart, showing the zone of cooptation of the mitral valve. This is the zone of cooptation of the mitral valve. And this is the personal law axis view of the normal heart, again showing the zone of cooptation of the mitral valve. Mind it, I have given a red arrow. This is the plane of mitral valve annulus, and this is the depth. This is the distance. It is the cooptation depth of the mitral valve. And this is these two arrow places, the cooptation height. 
these two concepts is very important for integrity or competence of the mitral valve. When what there is disruption of this factor, there is there is mitral regurgitation. And during the surgery, what surgeon do? He wants to restore these two parameters. He wants to restore the cooperation depth, want to restore the cooperation height. So this is the still picture of the cleft mitral valve, and this is the 3D image. Now mitral regurgitation in mitral valve prolapse. I will talk few words regarding this. What is mean by mitral valve prolapse? The MVP operates as a clinical entity with or without thickening. Thickening means more than five millimeter thickening. Major degree in diastasis with or without MR. And thickness of normal valve is less than three millimeter. So echocardiographic diagnosis of the mitral valve prolapse. It is the echocardiographic diagnosis of MVP is usually based on the plaques view and defined as systolic displacement of more than two millimeter of one or both mitral leaflets into LA below the plane of mitral annulus. And what does it looks like if the diagrammatic picture is the mitral valve annular plane and there is displacement of the both leaflets beyond the plane. And this is the 2D image of the 2D image of the MVP, and this is the M mode image showing the late systolic prolapse of the both leaflets yeah. uh, in M mode. And in this is the myxomatous disease of the mitral valve. Actually, it's a spectrum of disease. In one spectrum, there is it is characterized by gross leaflet thickening and redundancy, that is Barlow syndrome, and another ex extreme. That is characterized by relatively thin leaflets, that is fibroelastic deficiency. In between this, there is formifrosty. And you can see this table, there is three main important differences. If there is annular dilatation, it is almost normal limited fibrocystic deficiency and grossly dilated in Barlow's disease and intermediate in the formifrosty. And for Cordy, it is thin for fibroelastic, but irregular or elongated in the Barlow disease and frequently rupture in the fibroelastic deficiency. Now what is mean by the prolapse of the mitral leaflet and flail mitral leaflet? Prolapse means there is severe bowing of the leaflet or leaflet segment into LA with the tip of the leaflet still directed towards the ventricular apex. You can see the picture, there is prolapse of PML, but tip is still directed toward the LV apex. And this is the MRD to MDP. And what is mean by flail segment of the mitral valve? Where well, this usually occurs with caudal rupture. And there is flail segment of the leaflet such as that the leaflet is displaced into the LA in system with tip of the leaflet pointing away from the ventricular apex. And you can see the picture. This is the PML. And again, it is a flail. And the tip is away from the LV apex. This is the MR due to flail PML. Now what is, happens in the ischemia? There is abnormal contraction of the papillary muscle and underlying ventricular wall, and it is characterized by restricted leaflet motion, and that lead to tenting of the one leaflet, tethering of one leaflet, that is PML is tethering, in case of posterior medial papillary muscle dysfunction and inferior wall hypokinesia, and tenting of AML, that causes, an, it's an example, non-cooptation and MR. And what is mean by functional MR? The normal valve leaflets and body, LV dilatation and dysfunction, abnormal orientation of the papillary muscles and annular dilatation, causing systolic non cooperation of leaflets and MR. This is the diagrammatic picture showing the functional MR, LV dilatation of spherical shape, papillary muscle dysfunction, caudal tethering, restricted leaflet closure, mitral valve annular dilatation, and MR. So these are some few, uh, concept of the diastolic mitral regurgitation. It happens in dilated cardiomyopathy, and whenever there is prolonged PR interval in more than 200 milliseconds, and in severe acute AR, there may be diastolic MR. This is the picture of acute diastolic MR. So we are talking about the echocardiographic severe assessment of the severe severity of the mitral regurgitation. So you have to determine the severity of the MR and etiology. What are the parameters you can get from 2D echo? Actually, these are the parameters you can get from 2D. We have to assess the bulk morphology etiology, size of the mitral bulb annulus, dimension of LALB, evaluation of the size of RNRB, systolic function of LBRP, 
and the valgus and abnormality. So this is the peristernal loin cyst view in systole. We are measuring the LB end systolic dimension. Here, if the L systolic dimension, LB systolic dimension is 40 millimeter, or according to SCC, or 45 millimeter according to ESC, that is the indication of the mitral valve surgery in case of mitral regurgitation. And you have to dilate it, it will be indicate the severe MR. And this is the site for measurement of the mitral valve venulus. You have to measure hinge point to hinge point. And you can also the measure the LA dimension. And you have to take two measurement in, you have to take another measurement from apical two chamber view. Now you have to assess the LB and RB systolic function. So this is the primary focus on serial studies in patients with chronic ear and the key element in clinical decision making. So in patients with severe MR, normal LB EF is more than 60. And LB dysfunction defined as the less than 60 percent. So for mitral regurgitation, more than 60 is the normal. For aortic regurgitation, it is more than 50 is normal. And for aortic regurgitation, it is also more than 50 normal. But for mitral regurgitation, anything less than 60 is abnormal for ejection fraction. So what is the evidence of the LV dysfunction? Actually, it is the evidence of the progressive LV dilatation is the evidence of LV dysfunction. End systolic dimension more than 40 or 45, it is the evidence of LV dysfunction. Any reduction in the, in the LV systolic function, that is also the evidence of the LV dysfunction and should prompt consideration of surgical intervention, regardless of the symptomatic status of the patient, to prevent the irreversible LV dysfunction. So mind it, that these figures are very important for clinics and clinical decision making. Now strain analysis. Yes, it's important role. Have anything, any reduction in the global longitudinal strain indicate the LV dysfunction and should prompt to the uh, uh, from the decision for taking the intervention regarding the matter of surgery or other things. So these are the chamber impact on the severity of the mitral regurgitation. In mild MR, there is no chamber enlargement. Moderate MR, there is dilated LA. In severe MR, there is both LA and LB will be dilated. So these are some characteristic fine changes of the mitral valve in rheumatic heart disease. What are the changes that lead to dominant MR? And what are the changes that lead to dominant mitral stenosis? Actually, it is the predominantly contracture and fissure of the cordite tendinity and little fusion of the valvular commissure that lead to dominant MR. And predominant fusion of the commissure, in addition, subvalvular cordial thickening that lead to dominant MS. So this is the Sinelubi. You can see the characteristic of the mitral valve in rheumatic heart disease. You can see the both leaflets are thickened, particularly the apical one third of the both leaflets. The PML is immobile. Important thing is that the, uh, the coaptation depth and height is disrupted in this peristernal loisis disease. So it is giving rise to the MR. And this is the real picture, the classical picture of the severe mitral regurgitation while impinging MR jet and swells inside the LA cavity. That is the classical feature of the severe mitral regurgitation. Both LA and LV are dilated. And this is the synelubi of the frail AML. And this is the visitation attached to the AML in rheumatic heart disease. And this is the classical picture of the prolapse of PML in a man aged 65 years. The prolapse of PML. Now, M mod echo, what are the features we can evaluate by M mod echo in mitral regurgitation? We can evaluate the MVP that I have talked previously. We can evaluate the systolic and the motion of the mitral valve in HOCL. Actually, this is the normal mitral valve, uh, mitral valve in M mode, and this is the HOCM. You can see the thickened IVS and the systolic anterior motion of the anterior mitral leaflets. And this is the color M mode, very important whenever there is confusion. It is used, you can see, this is the uh, systole, systolic duration. And you can see the MVP in, uh, with late systolic marmar. This is the late systolic marmar. And this is the pent systolic, sorry, pent systolic mitral regurgitation. It is the late systolic mitral regurgitation. Now the Doppler echo in mitral regurgitation. 
So we can measure by Doppler ego, measure the emergent area in its nature. We can measure the vena contractive width and other features like volumetric method for calculation of the mitral regurgitated volume, proximal isolability service. The uh, I will not talk. And this is the schematic diagram showing how to evaluate the situation. Start with the initiation of the R wave and ends at the end of the T wave. This is mitral regurgitation. So J area method of mitral regurgitation. How can it done? Be? You can do it in two images, but. Particularly, or practically, we do in the apical fourth chamber view and two chamber view. Have an MR jet, freeze it, and trace it. Find out the area and average the two area. Then you can make a ratio with the L area. It will give you the mild, moderate, severe. What are the parameters for mild, moderate, severe? Less than 20% of the L area, that is indicate mild, and more than 40% indicate the severe MR. Now, this is an another system for grading of MR. You can grade MR by color Doppler. Grade 1, it is the 15% of the L area. Grade 2, 25% of the L area. 35, 3, and 60% is the grade 4 of the mitral degagitation. Now, Penda contractor method for severe the mitral degagitation, severity. It is the most practical initial method to assess the severity of the mitral degagitation. And Penda contractor is affected less by the eccentricity of the mitral regurgitation. So have an advantage over the PISA method for eccentric regurgitation jet. And, but you have to be careful regarding measuring of the vena contractor. You have to optimize the color flow imaging of the regurgitation jet by demonstrating. You have to demonstrate or to find a PISA, vena contractor, and regurgitation jet and magnify the region of interest, interest and measure the smallest weight immediately distal to the regurgitated orifice perpendicular to the direction of the jet. And you can see the classical image of the AMR is the apical four chamber view, zoom view. You have to adjust the image and gain setting to have the PISA, vena contractor and low axis of the AMR jet. And then you will get the narrow neck. This is the vena contractor vena contractor, and this is the ideal site for measurement of the vena contractor. Mind it, you have to optimize the image to clarify the PISA, vena contractor, and the law axis of the regurgitated jet. And these are the three examples how to measure the vena contractor. Now, vena contractor wise, what are the mild, moderate, severe parameters? This is the point 0.3, less than 0.3 mild, and more than 0.7 is the severe. Now, how to evaluate the mitral regurgitant volume, regurgitant fraction, and effective regurgitant orifice area? These three variables can be evaluated by volumetric method, and another is the PISA method. As I have said, these are not practically used in real life, so I will not go through this. I will just show the slides. Those who are interested, they can see the slides in the, from the record and study it and make them understanding of this. So these are the glimpses of slide. So these are the tables showing the mild, moderate, severity. I have talked all these things. Now for calculation of, calculation of the PSP and PA mean pressure, I have talked it under the mitral stenosis, so the process and procedures are the same. Now transesophageal ego in mitral regurgitation. Obviously, it's a better option in case of poor transesophageal ego window. Food for good understanding of the mechanism of pattern 
and routinely used in the power operative evaluation of the mitral valve repair. And stress ego, uh, yes, it is it for immediate this stratification and to guide the timing of the mitral valve surgery. This is the algorithm for mitral regurgitation evaluation. When I contract a less than 0.3 is the mild and more than seven, it is the severe. Like this, these are all figures I have shown it. These are the table, I will not repeat it. This is the staging table. But I will emphasize one thing regarding the secondary mitral regurgitation. You see, there are two variables. One is the regurgitant volume, another is the effective regurgitant orifice. In primary MR, it is more than 60 ml. That means the severe MR. But for secondary MR, it is more than 30. That means the severe MR. But and regarding the effective regurgitant orifice area, it is more than four that indicate severe, but it is more uh, point two or more that indicates severe for secondary MR. And so you have to, you have you have all the variables of the for mitral regurgitation, and you can now decide about the mild, moderate, severe MR. And if, if you want to do the staging system, now at the end you have to comment on mitral regurgitation in your report and mention about these are the figures. Etiology, severity of the MR, dimension of LA and LB, LB and RB, systolic function, and the PSP. And this is the end of the mitral regurgitation. So I'll switch on to the next topic. Aortic regurgitation. So aortic stenosis, sorry, aortic stenosis. So aortic stenosis encompasses the two entire, three entities from the subvalvular obstruction, valvular obstruction, and supravalvular obstruction. These are the etiology, I will not go through it. The subaortic stenosis type, fibromuscular type, and the fibromuscular tunnel type. These two are surgically amenable, repairable, but this is very poor prognosis. And these are the Subaortic stenosis, there's a subaortic membrane causing stenosis. This is the uh, subcostal view showing the subaortic membrane. This is the accessory mitral left leaflet causing a LBOT obstruction. And now about the supravalvular aortic stenosis. I'll show the, just the schematic picture. This is the membranous type, hourglass type, and tubular diffuse type. Now I will talk a few words about the rheumatic heart disease valve. Now, what are the factors or changes that predominantly lead to aortic stenosis and that predominantly lead to aortic, aortic regurgitation in case of rheumatic aortic valve? Actually, the predominant commissural fusion leads to aortic stenosis and predominant retraction and thickening of the cusp leads to aortic regurgitation. And these are the four pictures. This is the bicuspid valve. This is the calcific aortic valve disease, the rheumatic heart disease. And you can see there is fusion of the commission of the aortic valve. So this is then the diagrammatic picture, a schematic picture of bicuspid aortic valve to show that there is aortopathy. Aorta become dilated in course of time. So regarding bicuspid valve or severe aortic stenosis, you need to measure the dimension of the ascending aorta. So echocardiography in the aortic stenosis, we have to determine the severity of the AS and etiology. And what are the parameters we can evaluate by 2D echocardiography in aortic stenosis? So these are the parameters we have to evaluate. We have to evaluate LVOT diameter, aortic bulb annulus, aortic sinus, sinotubular junction, ascending aorta, LV hypertrophy, and LV and RV systolic function. All are very important. This is particularly the dimensions are very important. And what to measure the LVOT? Someone says one to two millimeter proximal to aortic. And but I think it is the widest diameter of the LVOT that should be measured. And these are the sites of measurement of the measurement. This is the aortic annulus site. This is a sinus, sinotubular junction, as in aortic. Mind it. Aortic annulus is measured during mid system, but all other measurements are done in diastole. And you have to look for the associated abnormalities of aortic dilatation and coexisting mitral valve disease. And this is the measurement of the ascending aorta. 
and look it whenever there is aortic valve disease that needs surgery with dilated ascending aorta and ascending aortic measurement is more than 45 mm then you need valve replacement as well as replacement of the ascending aorta that means ventus procedure now how can we evaluate the cross sectional every uh, open aortic valve in system by direct perimetry yes it can be done by trans visual echo and by 3d echo and mri but it is not possible with the trans thoracic echo because of the geometrical shape of the aortic valve and calcification and fibro fibrotic structure around the valve so this is the planimetry of by tee of the aortic valve and this is the planimetry of the by 3d echo now the response of the left ventricle to the pressure water due to aortic stenosis the typical response of the left ventricle as aortic stenosis severity gradually progresses is symmetrical increased left lv wall thickness that is concentric hypertrophy and importantly no change in chamber size that occurs in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and invaluable for the evaluation of the lv hypertrophy this is the today image and this is the m mod showing the lv hypertrophy of the 14 mm now you have to evaluate the systolic function of both lv and rv assessment of the wall motion and calculation of the ejection fraction a strain imaging of lv in aortic stenosis obviously this will unmask the subclinical dysfunction of the lv and nowadays it's an important parameter for guiding the valvular intervention or valvular surgery in severe aortic stenosis particularly the reduced global longitudinal strain now this is the serial loop of the rheumatic heart disease showing the aortic stenosis and the mitral stenosis you can see the systolic doming of the mitral aortic valve and diastolic doming of the mitral valve and thickening of the leaflets and you can see the apical five chamber view showing the high velocity cardiac flow echo across the aortic valve indicating now the m mod echo in the aortic stenosis actually m mod echocardiography has a limited role to play in the modern comprehensive echocardiographic examination but we can evaluate the partial mid systolic closure of the aortic valve due to subvalvular obstruction and we can evaluate the systolic and peripheral motion of the mitral valve due to hocm that i have demonstrated in the previous lecture so we will see what is maximum aortic valve cusp separation actually it is the distance between the uh, rcc and ncc in the no this is the normal diagrammatic picture this is the normal m mode for the aortic valve and in aortic stenosis the max is re get reduced and this is the typical picture of the severe aortic stenosis with reduced max and these are the figures initially started to evaluate the aortic stenosis you can see normal max is more than 15 but max less than 8 indicate the aortic valve area less than 0.75 and so on but nowadays attention the method of max is not used to daily clinical practice and no longer mentioned in present guidelines for valvular disease so this is the a mod again to get to diagnose the subval a partial mid systolic closure of the aortic valve maybe due to way to differentiate subvalvular from the valvular aortic stenosis is the important the uh, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve in sam i have talked it i will not go to this too now the doppler echocardiography for diagnosis of the aortic valve so the doppler echocardiography will allow us for measurement of the trans aortic jet velocity and we can calculate the stenotic orifice area of the aortic valve by continuity equation and we can calculate the mean trans aortic gradient using the modified barnoulli equation now we have to apply the continuous of doppler along the aortic valve in the apical five chamber view you have to make the parallel of the continuous of doppler with the aortic jet flow and you will get this type of spectral doppler image of the aortic stenosis and you have to trace it then you will get the maximum velocity here it is 4.4 peak velocity peak gradient 79 mean gradient 51 and the, you can also get the beta and all pulse obviously you have to mention the heart rate so an accurate measurement of the pressure gradient is sufficient to make clinical decisions in many cases and 
in the absence of significant air reduced lb here so but it is important you were to avail the maximum recording of the valve stenosis from all available window and you were to use all available like you can use the apical five chamber to uh, apical low axis peristernal right कनेक्शन मोबाइल क्या दरकार तुम्हारे मोबाइल ना कैटेलेट कल मन मामा <laughs> तो कर Is it the slide that I was talked last lastly? Yes, sir. Okay, these are the parameters of the valve gradient that indicate the mild, moderate, and severe. Now the calculation of the aortic valve area by Doppler record. So we can we we can measure the we can have and the calculation of the aortic valve area by two methods. One is the continuity equation by Echocardiography, and there is the Gordon formula from invasive measurement of the transaortic pressure gradient and the aortic cardiac transaortic cardiac output. Now continuity equation. I will not go details for this, but I will straight away go to the money way of the echocardiography that we can do the continuity equation. For meeting for fulfilling the continuity equation, we have to find out the three variables from the echocardiographic measurement. One is the LBOT diameter, and the TBA of the LBOT by passive Doppler, and TBA of the maximum aortic jet velocity. And I will show you. This is the schematic diagram. So you have to find out the LBOT dimension diameter from peristernal long axis view. You have to find out the passive velocity or of you know, the LBOT and VTI at tracing to find out the VTI. Then Have and continuously Doppler across the aortic bar, and you have to find out the PTI across the across the across the aortic bar. And now put the all the variables under this formula, and we'll get the aortic bar area. And these are the bar area that indicate mild, moderate, or severe. Mild means area of more than 1.5. Severe means less than one square centimeter. now what is been by doppler velocity index it is some many of them are says that the dimensionless index bar measurement what does it mean it is the lbot to aortic valve vti ratio 
So DVA is equal to LVOT versus aortic valve beta ratio. Actually, time velocity integral and velocity time integral, both the things are same concept. So first of all, you have to find out the continuous wave Doppler. By continuous wave Doppler, you have to find out the BTI across the aortic valve. Then you have to find out the BTI in LVOT. And then you have to ratio it. So Doppler velocity index is helpful when it is difficult to measure the LVOT diameter. And Doppler velocity index and aortic valve area should be more helpful under the circumstances of abnormally high in low stroke volume. So these are the parameters of the DVI. More than 0.5, it is mild, and more than point, less than 0.25, it is severe. So for coexisting aortic stenosis and regurgitation, aortic bulb cal area calculation is accurate. And also for aortic stenosis with MR, aortic bulb area calculation is important. So you have to, in patients with severe LV systolic dysfunction, and low cardiac output, assessing the severity of the aortic stenosis can be enhanced by assessing hemodynamic changes during dobutamine, dobutamine infusion. Now I'll talk a few words regarding the subvalvular and supravalvular aortic stenosis. Actually, continuous wave Doppler assessment of the peak and mean gradient is the cornerstone in evaluating patients with LVOT obstruction below and above the bulb. Here, bulb area and pressure half time are not applicable. And what is the clue for understanding the level of abstraction? Is it subvalvular, aortic valve level, or supravalvular level? Actually, it is the by demonstrating the site of color Doppler flow acceleration relative to the 2D images that provide a clue that the abstraction is not at the level of the bulb and prompt the more detailed imaging investigation of the pathology. So this is the parastonal Lawrence's view. These are the three markings. So the site of the color flow acceleration means the site of abstraction. And this is the approach of eco assessment algorithm. So what are the standard clinical parameters of aortic stenosis severity? So you have the, these are the trans aortic velocity, mean trans aortic pressure gradient, and aortic valve rate. These are the parameters for severe aortic stenosis. Peak velocity more than four meter, mean gradient more than 40, aortic valve area less than one, and LVOT DVI dimension is less than 0.25. Note, evaluation of the aortic severity is affected by presence of systemic hypertension, so that re-evaluation of the blood pressure control may be necessary. So these are the all tabulated form of mild, moderate severity parameter. I have talked all the parameters with each respective parameters. So I'll not go details to this. One thing, many of them are, many of us ask about the mild gradient of the, gradient of the mild aortic stenosis. I have seen it in internet that 10 to 19 maybe millimeter mercury of mean gradient may be regarded as a range of mild aortic stenosis. Now regarding the uh, aortic bulb, scler aortic sclerosis and specific aortic bulb disease, this is all another and spectrum of disease start from normal valve and end at the end there is specific aortic valve disease with severe stenosis. But there is some cut level till today the concept is that whenever whatever the velocity is less than 0.25 meter per second then we will label as an aortic sclerosis. Beyond this level we have to label as an a specific aortic valve disease with mild, moderate, or severe stenosis. These are again the parameters of mild, moderate, severe table. I will not go details to this. But regarding the staging system, I want to draw your attention the stage C and stage D. These are severe aortic stenosis. C is the asymptomatic, D is the symptomatic. But we have five categories C1, C2, D1, D2, D3. So severe aortic stenosis have five categories. But regarding the C1, there is one category that is very severe aortic stenosis. It is actually, it is leveled on the basis of the velocity, not on the basis of the ball area. It is the velocity, maximum velocity more than five meter and mean gradient more than 60 is regarded as a very severe. And mitral, 
LV dysfunction is regarded less than 50% of the ejection fraction. Now regarding the G1, G2 and D3, I will not go details of this, but regarding the G2, we need to challenge the patient with dobutamine stress equal to exclude some pseudo-severe aortic stenosis and true aortic stenosis and cardio cardiomyopathy. So the, it need, these are the some sorts of patient need uh, dobutamine stress echo. And these are the paradoxical low flow, low gradient, severe aortic stenosis. Actually, they have normal ejection fraction, but they have decreased stroke volume. They have small LV cavity. They have LV hypertrophy, diastolic dysfunction. They have other comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, like so. I will not go details to this. So these are the types of severe aortic stenosis. I will not go details to this. I will highlight some points regarding the Doppler-derived Doppler equal derived pressure gradient versus catheter derived pressure gradients. Actually, this is the schematic of catheter derived pressure tracing. This is the LV tracing and this is the aortic tracing. And this is the vertical line it represents the peak to peak gradient. And this is the this vertical line, it represents the peak instantaneous gradient in catheter. And this peak instantaneous gradient correlate with the or analogous with the peak gradient of the Doppler velocity. And this is the mean gradient of the Doppler velocity. And these area indicate the mean pressure gradient in Kethler. But this mean gradient does not match with this peak gradient or peak instantaneous gradient. These are the two different. Actually, peak gradient is, there, is not the real measurement. What happens in the Kethler, actually the catheter tip is kept in the LBOT, take the measurement, then pull it in the outer, then take another one. So it, not, it is not the instantaneous pressure, it is, an, it is an calculated pressure. The another picture of main gradient in Kathler. So Doppler maximum gradient corresponds to the most maximum instantaneous gradient by catheter measurement and Doppler mean gradient cor corresponds to the catheter measured mean gradient. Neither Doppler gradient correlates with the peak to peak gradient reported at catheter emission. So, mean gradient should be compared between Doppler and catheter based technique to avoid the potential condition. So, uh, we have now all the parameters to decide about the mild, moderate severity of the aortic valve disease and the staging of the aortic valve severity. These are the parameters you have to comment in your equal report. So this is the end of the aortic stenosis. Am I bombarding the thinking process of the audience? Sorry. Now I will talk about the aortic regurgitation. So this is the re definition of the aortic regurgitation. Aortic regurgitation occurs when the disease of the when there is disease of the aortic valve reflex and the aortic root or both and causes inadequate diastolic cooperation of the bulbs and backward to across the bulb. So we need to understand that for understanding of the aortic regurgitation, we need to understand the bulb lifted disease and the aortic root disease. What is mean by aortic root? Actually, this is the portion of the aorta that means the aortic root. It includes the aortic anulus, sinus, sinotubular junction, and the proximal part of the tubular portion of the ascending aorta. And it is the parastomal Lawrence's view showing the aortic root include the annulus, sinus, sinotubular junction, and part of the tubular ascending aorta. And this is the diagrammatic representation of the aortic root aneurysm in Marfan syndrome. And this is the surgical meaning of the aortic root replacement. And these are some etiologic classification of the air. These are chronic primary air of the aortic bulb. This is the aorta and air, acute air. I will not go details to this. Actually, this is a myxomatous aortic valve that leads to collapse of the RCC and air. You can see the air due to annular aortic actitia and the rheumatic heart disease. This is the bicuspid valve showing the dissection type A and collapse of the dissection flap and that herniates into the LVOT during diastole. This is the root dilatation causing severe air. 
So ventricular septal defect, when it causes air, large outlet BSD may cause prolapse of the RCC and or NCC resulting in air. How does it cause? You can see. This is the prolapse of RCC. This is the BSD. You can see the shape. It is protruding inside the RDOT through the BSD orifice. And you can see the cine movie. You can see this is the BSD and there is the prolapse of the RCC and you can see the shape. Now you can see the color flow jet. This is the BSD jet flow. This is the air jet flow away from the BSD and impinging the AMA. And so this is the diagrammatic picture of the evolution of the aortic annulus and laceration of the neuroconic arch due to plant trauma. So echocardiography in aortic regurgitation. So this is the confirmatory technique for diagnosis of the air. And color flow Doppler is the sonographic hallmark of air. And these are the purpose of eco study is to evaluate severity of the air, to understand the etiology, to understand the effect of the volume of under dot LB, and to evaluate the status of the other cardiac pumps. Now from 2D echo, what are the parameters we can evaluate? So we can directly visualize the aortic root and aorta for diagnosis the etiology. And these are the parameters we have to measure. I have said, I have mentioned in aortic stenosis and LBADV, LBIDS, and LB and RV systolic function. So you have to measure this function. Now what is mean by the large aortic annulus? Actually, aortic annulus more than 30 to 35, it is mean the large annulus and it requires the reduction in plastic. And this is the aortic annulus measurement. What is mean by smaller size aortic annulus? Actually, it is the less than 0.19 millimeter. That is labeled as a small aortic size annulus. And these are the uh, patients that need aortic root enlargement procedure with excision. And this is again the measurement of the ascending aorta. Now assessment of the left ventricle. So typically in chronic air, LB size slowly increases over a period of years without impairment of the systolic function. But among patients with preserved systolic function and increasing chamber size, particularly the end systolic dimension or volume, is generally regarded as an early manifestation of decompensation and frequently an indication for aortic valve replacement. Now you see, here is the LB end systolic, end systolic dimension. If it is more than 50, then this is the parameter for indication of the aortic valve surgery. And LB end diastolic dimension, if it is more than 65, according to ACC, and more than 70, according to ESC, then it is an indication for aortic valve sizing. So in chronic air, LB systolic dysfunction eventually occurs in presence of hemodynamically significant chronic volume overload. And in some individuals, irreversible LB systolic dysfunction supervenes even in the absence of clinical symptom. So early detection is important. So these are the parameters for normal LB EF, mild, mind it, severe LB dysfunction means less than 40% ejection fraction. For other cases, particularly for ischemic heart disease and dilated cardiomyopathy, it is the 30% that is severe, but for air, it is less than 40, that is the severe. The strain analysis, yes. Again, the decreased strain indicate LV dysfunction and suggest the intervention or valve surgery. These are the still pictures showing the severe air. I am mentioning here the LV dimension. At the basal level, there is moderately enlarged, but at the mid and mid level, it is severely enlarged and takes the spherical global shape. So you can see this is the typical picture of the severe aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation, leading to LV dilation, LV dilatation, and significant spherical shape of the LV. So largest left ventricular dimension, LBRDD in air. So among patients with chronic severe have the largest end diastolic volume of any form of heart disease, resulting in so-called poor bobinum and weight may increase more than 500. So you have to assess the LB, now M mode, how it helps. It is the high frequency fluttering of the mitral leaflet in M mode and increased E wave septal separation. So you can see this is the normal M mode. You can see the fluttering of AML and increased E point septal separation that indicates the severe MR. Now Doppler echo in 
in assessment of the aortic regurgitation. Now, what are the things we can use the color Doppler imaging, fast Doppler, and continuous wave Doppler? These are the parameters we can assess with the Doppler echo, regurgitant jet width, LVT diameter ratio, vena contractor width, aortic regurgitant pressure up time, hollow diastolic flow reversal in the ascending aorta. Other parameters are effective regurgitant orifice, regurgitant volume, regurgitant fraction, mitral inflow pattern. This black area is I will not mention, but I will talk about these colorful areas. So color imaging of the is the most useful technique to assess air. Now small transient air, jets of air can be a normal variant, this is the normal air. So color jet dimension should be assessed with the Nyquist setting of 50 to 60. Now, we have to assess the regurgitant jet height to left ventricular output track diameter ratio. Air jet height versus LVT diameter ratio. This is the most practical issue used in daily to day clinical practice. Very important parameter can be done in practical life. So, you have to find out the classical personal noise is being and you have to search out the origin, origin of the ARJ. And just it is that below the level of the valve tips, level of the tip, tip of the aortic valve and measure the jet height and compare it with the LVT height. Another is that you have to find out the classical short axis view, just proximal to the aortic valve orifice and find out the regurgitant jet area and compare it with the LB outflow tract dimension. And these are the, this is an example of the severe air. And another thing, the length of air jet conveys unreliable information about the water severity. And this is the interpretation of the regurgitant jet height to LBOT diameter ratio. So any height, regurgitant jet, less than 25% of LBOT is mild, and more than 65% it is severe. These are the mild, moderate, severe area. Now the vena contractor width of air jet. So this is the smallest neck of the flow region at the level of the aortic valve and immediately below the flow convergence region and the smaller than the width of the jet in the LBOT. And this is the waist of the regurgitant jet and this is the classical picture of the aortic regurgitation. But you have to optimize the image and you have to make sure of the three component of the aortic regurgitant jet. You have to find out the proximal flow convergence area, then, then the vena contractor and the LVOT, the long axis in LVOT. And this is the short neck that indicate the vena contractor. This is the measurement of the vena contractor, the parastone long axis group. But mind it, you have to find that the flow convergence like the PISA, and you have to optimize the image. Now these are the parameters for mild, moderate, severe for the vena contractor, less than three mile and more than six severe. This is the mild air, this is the severe air. Same patient at two years interval. So it indicates the importance of the follow-up of patients. This is the cine loop of moderate air and this is the cine loop of the severe air in case of aortic root dilatation of Marfan syndrome. And this is the rheumatic heart disease with, with the visitation attached to the aortic valve. And it is the color Doppler image showing the severe air. Now continuous wave Doppler and aortic pressure have time. How does it help us to determine the severity of the air? And so you have to put the continuous of Doppler in five chamber view, and you have to make parallel with the air jet flow. And you will get this type of image. And you have to study the density of the Doppler image and the, and the slope of the image. By, by studying the, the density of the air spectral events, you can decide the mild, moderate, severe. So see, this is the mild air. And this is the density of the spectral image. This is the aortic density. It is, it is more than this. So this is the mild air. And it is and another picture, mild air, less dense, more severe air, more dense. So these are the study of the slope and pressure of time of the air gel. So you can study the slope. The less the slope, mild is the air. Steep is the slope, severe is the air. 
and these are the parameter of the mild moderate severe air mind it in acute air the pressure up time less than 250 is severe but for chronic air less than 200 that is severe now the hollow dust will flow reversal in the descending aorta what does it mean actually the hollow dust will flow reversal in the abdominal aorta that is that is imaged by pulse wave dropper in the subcostal view indicate the severe air in case of chronic severe air but for acute air it is the descending thoracic aorta that indicate the severe air. so you have to measure the psp and pm in pressure like other thing but these are the parameters regarding the Resident fraction, effective because so these are the glimpses of slides, like the glimpses of wall history of the Nehru. So, trans esophageal echo is needed whenever there is poor trans thoracic echo and better understanding of the mechanism of the air. This is the algorithm of the air. And so, I will talk a few features about the acute uh, air. This is a very important because it needed the echocardiographic evaluation and confirmation of the diagnosis. So these are the points you have to evaluate by echocardiography in the setup of acute severe air. Direct visualization of the aortic root for dissection, collapse, or visitation. You have to assess the LP dimension, a mode, color flow, continuous wave dropper, and flow reversal in the descending thoracic aorta. That will be the hollow diastolic flow reversal and diastolic MR. So this is the high pulse rate clinical scenario. So high frame rate modalities are useful for diagnosis. A mode and continuous wave dropper will be more helpful in, for diagnosis in this grave situation. So in acute air, there is premature closure of the mitral valve That can be evaluated by M mode. You see this picture. This is the physiological closure line of the mitral valve. But in severe acute air, it, it is premature comes to this point. So this is the premature closure of the mitral valve in severe acute air. And this is another same picture image to show you the uh, diastolic MR and steep slope of the continuous wave Doppler image. And this is the continuous wave Doppler sharp, steep down slope of the air pressure up time. I have mentioned it. It is less than 250 indicate the severe air. And this is the so from supra-sternal notes, you have to record the hollow diastolic flow reversal in the descending thoracic aorta. This is the restrictive inflow view, inflow image of the mitral valve in severe acute air. These are the parameters of the severe acute air. No, so important is the so single, no single measure of regurgitant severity is sufficient for clinical decision making. Instead, the clinician and sonographer must take into account all available data so that a comprehensive assessment of the severity can be obtained. So these are the tabulated form of, of the all parameters of mild, moderate, severe. I will not go details to this. So I've talked it in the each and every subsets. So now we have to decide the mild, moderate, severe of the air. These are the staging system. And at conclusion, you have to mention these are the following parameters you have to mention in your report. So this is the end of the aortic regurgitation. Now, about the leftist and to rightist. Uh, to switch over the right-sided valvular heart disease, I will make it short and convenient. Actually, what I think, it is very difficult to study. It's a very difficult task in the world, I think, to study and to make answer skin. Because that's why there is so much so prevalence of the dropout. Varashnaka Kodhinkas. Arun Maski, can you understand my points, the Bengali? And I want to mention one author, a poet, Kalidas. It was very difficult to make good 
But later on, it was very palatable. So I want to make it later things palatable. I want to talk about the tricuspid valve stenosis, the gateway to the heart. Actually, the greater, greatest way to the heart is through the stoma, and it is the tricuspid valve, the gateway of the heart. So what is mean by tricuspid stenosis? The obstruction of the blood flow from RA to RV. This is the normal tricuspid valve. And tricuspid stenosis, almost always rheumatic origin. And most patients with rheumatic tricuspid valve have TR and TS. These are the causes. Echocardiographically, you have to evaluate that these are the parameters that you have to etiology, dimension of RA. But the important thing, you have to assess the size of IVC. And it is the color Doppler gradient that is the only parameter for severity. There is no parameter for calculation of the valve area and pressure uptake. So 2D echo, you have to assess the anatomy, you have to find out the dilated ARA and dilated IVC in severe, in severe uh, stenosis and all the features of rheumatic heart disease like mitral valve, I'll not go details to this, Doppler echo. The severe rate of the ATS is best assessed by Doppler direct mean gradient. So this is the Doppler continuous wave Doppler placement. This is the gradient across the tricuspid valve. Mean gradient is 11. So severe tricuspid regurgitation. Tricuspid stenosis, sorry. Severe tricuspid stenosis. At the valve rate, heart rate of 77. So anything that is less than two mean gradient, that is normal for tricuspid valve. But anything that is more than two millimeter, that is abnormal for, abnormal for tricuspid valve. And you can see anything above the, above the more than five millimeter, it is significant for tricuspid stenosis because you want to, I want to describe it, the relatively modest diastolic pressure gradient, mean gradient, only five millimeter usually is sufficient to elevate the mean RA pressure to levels that results in severe that results in systemic venous congestion and is associated with ascites and edema. So what is mean by severe tricuspid stenosis? Mean gradient more than seven. And there is some respiratory variation for tricuspid valve. So you have to measure with patient hold his or her breath in expiration. So there need not to measure the valve barrier. So this is the RA size and RT, uh, tricuspid annulus. This is the, you can see in a leaf, we have the severe aortic stenosis. You have the color and more, color flow. So you can decide the mild, moderate, severe. There is no staging of the aortic bulb stenosis. So in conclusion, you have to mention these parameters. This is the end of tricuspid stenosis. Now I am switch over to the tricuspid regurgitation. So definition is the leakage of the blood from RB to RA through the tricuspid valve. These are the etiology. These are the annular some points regarding the annular dimension. Actually, tricuspid valve is very prone to dilatation because of anatomical characteristics. There is lack of fibrous continuity of the aortic valve, tricuspid valve in this region. So it dilates very frequently. So these are the annular dilatation more than four. Pacemaker and defibrillator leads distort the tricuspid valve and leads to tear. Ischemic heart disease may lead to tear. Carcinoid heart disease lead to tear. Endocarditis. So there are some congenital tricuspid anomalies. Some are with displacement like Epstein anomaly. Some are without displacement like tricuspid valve dysplasia. Now echocardiography, 2D wise. What are the parameters we have to evaluate? We have to evaluate the RV dimension, RA dimension, RV systolic function. And these are the parameters we have to evaluate. Normal, what, how can we quantitate the RV dilatation? And actually, RV diameter equal to LV diameter means the moderately dilated RV. RV diameter is more than LV diameter, it is severely dilated RV. So these are the schematic diagram to show how the, why to take the measurement, or to take the measurement, but to take the, this is the basal RV diameter more than 42 is dilated. Subcostal wall thickness more than five indicate RV hypertrophy. I will not go details to this. 
this is the feature of the pressure water, D-shaped IVS leading system. Now paradoxical septal motion of the RV is occurred, it is seen in the volume overload of RV. The IVS moves a downward in diastole and upward in systole. That is the paradoxical septal motion. So color Doppler, actually, there is some two differences in the color Doppler image. These are the mild, moderate severity of the tricuspidic agitation, less than five mild, five to 10 moderate, less than 10 severe. When I contact them, more than seven is the severe, the severe TR. But there is some difference of TR severity. TR associated with high peer pressure, TR associated with low peer pressure. There is difference. What is difference? TR associated with high peer pressure that show high velocity TR jet with aliasing color flow, easy to appreciate and evaluation. These are seen the left sided bulb disease with MS and MR that leads to pulmonary hypertension. And you can see that TR, high velocity TR, easily, easily appreciable and high density TR jet flow. But TR associated with low peer pressure, these are laminar color flow, not easy to appreciate, may be underestimated. And these are seen in primary RV myocardial disease with dilatation, abstinent anomaly, and dysplastic TB. And this is the severe TR, but laminar flow, blue flow. This is the, but there is a steep down or slope of that Doppler flow. So this is the severe TR of low flow. This is the this is the pacemaker lead leading to tear. This is the trauma leading to tear. This is the tear, tear, tear jet flow. So difference between tear and MR hemodynamic is that you can see. For MR and tear, the same effective orifice area, 0 0.4, 0 0.4. But regurgitant flow 60 is severe for MR, but 45 ml is severe for tear. This is due to pressure gradient across the bar of the, of the two sides. So, this is important, very important. The important for ego. As TR is a dynamic lesion, which is downgraded by general anesthesia, the absence of TR in the intraoperative TEE is an unreliable indicator of severity under normal loading conditions. And the presence of TR on the preoperative ECO becomes no more reliable indicator. So important, under anesthesia, TR may disappear. So PISA load, I will not go discuss to you. So these are the parameters. These are the parameters indicate the mild, moderate, severe, severe tier. And you have to mention now the mild, moderate, severe tier. There are no staging system for tier. Now pulmonary valve stenosis, I will highlight few points. There is three level of obstruction that lead to pulmonary stenosis, subvalvular, valvular, and supravalvular. These are the levels. I will not know go details to this. Supravalvular pulmonary stenosis. Actually, in severe pulmonary stenosis, there is some change in the RB. There is a RB hypertrophy, particularly the RBOT hypertrophy, and there may also lead to an RB dilatation and dysfunction. I will highlight some two types of valve: dysplastic pulmonary valve and the pliable pulmonary valve those which are amenable for valvuloplasty. So this is the, there is some difference between pliable pulmonary valve with stenosis and dysplastic pulmonary valve with stenosis. These are helpful diagnostic tips for echocardiogram. Annulus in, in case of pliable pulmonary valve, mildly dilated, but it is hypoplastic or smaller in dysplastic valve. Leaflets shows restricted movement with systolic grooming and pliable valve, but thicken and immobile in dysplastic valve. Main pulmonary artery, very important, dilated in pliable bulb, but not dilated, rather smaller in this plastic bulb. Now, echocardiographically, you to measure, these are the parameters, annulus, main valvular, main pulmonary artery, and LPRP. This is the normal picture. This is normal picture. This is the parastonal low axis RV outflow view. This is the picture of the, the systolic doming and Doppler. This is the classical picture of the systolic doming of the pliable valve. And you can see, this is the classical picture, the pliable valve with severe stenosis. These are suitable for pulmonary valvoplasty. There is no arbitrary obstruction. And you can see, 
So, mean uh, it actually it is the peak gradient of the continuous wave Doppler jet that is the determinant of the severity of the pulmonary valve stenosis. This is that continuous wave Doppler flow across the pulmonary valve, and you can see this is the Doppler flow, and this is that continuous wave Doppler flow across the pulmonary valve. The peak pressure is 64, meaning the severe. So this is the mild, moderate, severe. This is the mild, moderate, severe. More than 35 mild, more than 60 severe. Another parameter, RV pressure less than half of LB is mild. RV pressure more than 75% of the LB, it is severe. So you can now decide about the mild, moderate, severe. Any you report you have to mention, these are the parameters that the mention you have to report. Mind it, you have to mention about the shunt anomaly, RBOT obstruction and RB hypertrophy. Now, pulmonary valve regurgitation, the last talk. Last talk of my topics. Definition, it is the regurgitation of the valve flow through the pulmonary valve due to the insufficiency of the, insufficiency of the valve during that stroke. Actually, trivial or mild regurgitation of PR is common in normal subjects. These are the causes. And most of the causes of the pulmonary valve regurgitation is due to complication of the procedure. It is after pulmonary valve pulmonary valvuloplasty. Whenever there is higher sizes balloon are used, and the uh, and the effect of the childhood surgery, particularly for tetralogy of fallow, and PR has been shown to progress over time. Now echocardiography. These are the parameters you have to evaluate by echocardiography. 2D wise. You have to see the volume overload of the RV, that is dilatation of the RV. The color Doppler is the main parameter for evaluation of the severity of the pulmonary valve regurgitation. This is the mild, moderate, severe part of the severity of the pulmonary regurgitation. Now I will point, highlight some points regarding the key eco features of the severe PR in post-operative top pressures. These are tricky. There is laminar low velocity regurgitant flow by color flow, and there is diastolic flow reversal in the branch pulmonary artery, and the passive Doppler signal of pulmonary regurgitation demonstrate a rapid return to baseline. That are the tips of severe pulmonary regurgitation. So this is the picture of the severe pulmonary regurgitation. The flow reversal in the branch pulmonary artery, and it is, it is laminar in flow. This is the sharp or steep pressure of time, and this is, the, this is the Doppler signal. So these are the parameters of the severe pulmonary regurgitation. Jet weight and RBT annulus more than 70, pressure of time less than 100, and like so. And flow, uh, diastolic flow reversal in the pulmonary artery. And see, these are the table showing the features of the stages of the severe air. These are the parameters of the severe air, severe pulmonary regurgitation. I will not go details to this. So now decide about the mild, moderate, severe. In staging, no A and B, but there is C and D. And mention the following parameters if to comment in your ECO report. And this is my very favorite slide. I am at the end of my lecture. The wisdom implies the timely and rightful application of knowledge. And knowledge may even be a pitfall or an encumbrance unless you learn to use it justly. So this is an wonderful coexistence of two different spaces in the same platform and excellent management of the nature. Thank you for your patient sharing. Sorry to bombard your information. Thank you, sir. 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 Uh, sir, what do sir? Few comments, then go to the directly to the students. Yeah, uh, this sir, is a wonderful slice, lecture. Slice I, I wish I had teachers like you when I was a student, and this sort of uh, sir, sir, stop, share, sir. stop share. Okay, yeah, just stop. Okay, sir. Net service is present at that time. Then that would have been very nice because. What I'm learning now after 
at 20 years, I could have learned much earlier on. <laughs> Thank you. Still, it's wonderful to learn so many things. And actually, we ask many questions to the students regarding many things. I'll be asked and by naming the just questions to, to for the students only. Very simple thing, but we often ask them. And for example, why we consider vital is our favorite? We call that you are calling it thick. Why not you are calling the public the thick? Don't you know? Our thickness. Yes. In vital valve. Why should you yes. call it thick? What actually, should be the upper limit? Actually, actually, it is the more than actually normal valve thickness is the three, but upper limit three millimeter. Five millimeter. Actually, more yeah. than three, you should call it as a thick micro valve. Yeah. Acha. The second question you ask if you are calling it thick, even in vital valve prolapse, you can get it a relatively thick valve. What's the difference between the rheumatic uh, thick valve and the mitral valve prolapse where we can get sometimes some thick uh, thickness of the valve? Yes, very important question, very important. Actually, one important thing, both the scenario depicts and the thick mitral valve, okay? But the echogenicity of the both valve is different. One is the echolucent type, another is the echo bright type. Another important thing is the pattern of the movement of the mitral valve. Very important. There is restriction of the movement of the mitral valve, but in case of the mitral valve, mixomatous mitral valve, they are very smart in movement. There is extensive movement. You can see the classification of the mitral valve prolapse. You can see that actually there is some type. The mitral MVP shows the smart or excessive movement of the valve, the thickness. And both the scenario may show the thick mitral valve, but the echocardiographic characteristics is different. And another thing is that in mitral valve in rheumatic heart disease, the PMA, PML will be immobile. It's a very important, important feature of the rheumatic heart disease yeah. leading to mitral valve disease. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Motin, Amy Motin. Uh, can I add something? Can, okay. can I ask something? Okay, yeah. What is that? Yeah. In rheumatic heart disease is the tip that will be affected also in case of mixed metal valve. But the calcification is very unusual in case of mixed metal valve. Again, the commercial fusion is the whole part of rheumatic metal valve. Right. Right. Third, right. third, involvement of the aortic valve also in favor of rheumatic heart disease. Involvement of the sub valvular apparatus that also goes for uh, a, in favor of rheumatic heart disease. And the valve movement is very typical of mismetal mitral valve, as you are saying, very smart movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I have comment about that regarding only confining to the valve movements. Yeah. There are other no, subvalvular and paravalvular chains. A lot of questions about the students. Okay. Dr. Amy Motin, please ask your question. Assalamu alaikum, sir. I'm Dr. Motin. Uh, my, uh, at first, I would like to thank Kobir Jaman sir for his nice lecture. Uh, I have two questions. First question is, what are the earliest echocardiographic findings, morphological features in 2D echo in rheumatic heart disease before the development of the mild MS or mild MR? And my second question is, what are the okay. importance okay. of... Okay, sir. Okay, one by one, one by one. Yes, it's a very important question. It's a very important question because most of the time in our real life practice, we see there is someone is commenting the rheumatic heart disease, but we are commenting the normal one. Actually, what is the nature of the thickening of the mitral valve disease in rheumatic heart disease? The thickening starts at the margins of the defect. It goes towards the annulus. So it is the apical part or marginal part that start getting thick, thickening. And it is the subvalvular structure immediately adjoining to the valve leaflet or tip of the AML that get thickening. So you have to start it very carefully. Is there any thickening of the apical part? And is there thickening of the subvalvular part of the immediately adjoining to the 
vital work. So these are the point, these two points that you can differentiate the rheumatic change or normal power in the absence of the commissural fusion and other. Thank you. And 3D equal also helps, isn't uh, it? Uh, 3D equal very helpful in that. Uh, Dr. Abutin? Can I add something uh, more soon before? Uh, yeah. or, uh, sir, after sir, the, sir. After the question, sir. Sir, sir. Sir, sir. Sir, sir. Sir, one and a half minute possibly. Uh, the basic, I just I giving some idea about the general aspect of the mitral valve. The mitral valve reflex, especially in the anterior mitral valve reflex, should be staged or sectioned by the BCR method. B is the basal part, C is the clear zone with the middle part, and the rough zone is the anterior part or the distal part. So the actually when an acute rheumatic fever, basically the coaptation zone is involved which is the part of the rough zone, what you call rough zone, because it is slightly thick and even in normal part. So all the pathological things usually starts in the, in the uh, rough zone, means the apical zone. And then subsequently it involves. For that, uh, the four parameters, you can find there the, the involvement of the mitral valve leaflet, and the extent of mitral valve plate and other things. So this is the important idea to take things. Yes. And in normally, it, uh, in the younger child, uh, where rheumatic fever, uh, say for about five to 15 years old, uh, usually part because the thickening or inflammation starts in the rough part. So rough part uh, uh, thick, thickness should not, should not cross to, or in the adult maybe to, Two millimeter, and if any of the, if it is more than three millimeter, try to think that something may happen. And whatever bit, uh, the difference between uh, the rheumatic and the uh, other flail uh, valve agitant, I think uh, they are nice. So thank you. These are the important points. So try to remember the different zones of it. In our st student days, and even my earlier days, even my student days, we try to remember this as BCR basal zone, clear zone, and. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, last question. Motin, last question. Thank you, sir. I have another question. That is practically we got sometimes we get some reports with tri trivial aortic regurgitation and trivial mitral regurgitation. What is the importance of this uh, mentioning of this? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Okay, Motin. We understood. Thank Actually, you. Actually, on a trivial air and trivial MR, they mentioned in the aortic report. Yes, it's a very important issue. Actually, in the setup of morphologically normal valve, trivial air and trivial MR are physiological findings. It, you may not mention in your comment. You can comment in your description. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Once you comment it, comment it then the clinician or, or attendants of the patient may receive it or perceive it that is there maybe any disease and so that may create a pain. So you can uh, you can you can mention it in the description, but don't mention it in your comments. That's it. Yes, sir. Doctor, thank you, sir. Well, unmute yourself. Uh, did unmute. Uh, quick question. One question. Why in a single question? One question, lots of question. Yeah. My question, according to the self, my aortic valve, valve uh, what is the clinical importance, or uh, from the or uh, from the surgical point of view, the diameter of the LVOT to measure the diameter of LVOT in case of aortic stenosis. Okay. Sometimes there are asymmetric hypertrophy of the basal part of the IVS that may behave like an same in some subsets of patient. So there is narrowing of the LBOT. And that time you have to measure the LBOT to guide the surgeon. Is there any necessity for the resection of the LBOT or the basal part of the IBS? Because it is seen that after replacement of the aortic valve, there are some subsets of patient that present to the LBOT gradient. Actually to minimize that confusion or to parameter, you have to measure the LBOT. If you find that their LBOT is narrow, and you have to mention in your, in your report to uh, draw attention of the surgeon. Yes. Thank you. We should, 
उसको गिवन बाय दैट एयर रिजल्ट्स इन एसिमेट्रिक सेप्टल हाइपरट्रोफी एलटी स्टिल से रिजल्ट्स इन कॉन्सेंट्रिक हाइपरट्रोफी सो इन केस ऑफ एयर इट्स अ रियली इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग बिकॉज़ समटाइम्स द अंडरसाइजिंग ऑफ द फाल एंड आल्सो द एसिमेट्रिक सेप्टल हाइपरट्रोफी बोथ लीड्स टू परसिस्टेंस ऑफ अ ग्रेडिएंट एक्रोस्टी आउटिंग फाल डिस्पाइट द एवियर डॉक्टर राहत राहुल कदीर प्लीज आस्क अ क्वेश्चन thank you sir so my question is atrial fibrillation with fast ventricular rate is a problematic for measurement of any kind of value can we use any kind of vagotonic maneuver during the procedure such as carotid sinus massage or valsalva maneuver thank you sir actually actually uh, in this setup the aortic mane uh, uh, af with fast ventricular rate it is beyond the control of any nerve not control is an organic problem so you cannot do this you can control it this there is no clinical evidence like this uh, so to uh, to the my knowledge but i think there is no it's not the way to measure the carotid is an organic problem so you have to control the heart rate with medicine with medication then you have to review the echo actually it is been say that if you have to assist with the patient for surgery and whether it is a high flow high gradient low flow low gradient or paradoxical gradient then if the heart rate is very high you have to control it reassess again yes yes then decide the for first the yes. level of the patient for surgery. that is the way that is the way. echo and in echocardiography report it should be mentioned that the patient is in tachycardia or bradycardia patient is sinus rhythm or a fibrillary rhythm right so these are the parameter it should be mentioned in the report thank you dr sami islam dr sami islam very exam yeah. to ask in case of ms if the patient af what is the reliable method of aerial measurement yes it's a very important question that we ask yes yes it sir. is the only yes, the planimetry yeah. planimetry is the only answer and it is the Uh, what can I say? Gold standard for diagnosing the uh, severity of the mitral stenosis. All other features are supportive features. My second question then is that the, the, we ask the patient, uh, students, that what about the calcified MS? Is there uh, planimetry has any fallibility in there? Calcified, calcified MS. Is planimetry as reliable in there, or the pressure half time is uh, better? In case of okay, calcified okay. MS, yeah. actually in that case is the pressure of time will be more reliable but because the calcification will will mask your tracing you will hide your image calcification is a very enemy very detrimental for the sound wave so you will not get the proper image in that case the transvalvular gradient and pressure of time will help you and also the size of the la and tsp all these things will guide you to decide about the severity of the mitral stenosis but is it is 3d echo far better in this case yes 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 3d echo is better if, and it, it is recommended in the set of a heavy dense calcification 3d echo is recommended but is costly and it need a better understanding and and it, it need a orientation even anatomical orientation is needed for 3d echo like the 2d Dr. Sami, do you hear me? I think yes. Was it? I can uh, prepare two per student uh, sequentially, yeah. so they will be prepared to ask question. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Arif. Yes, sir. Uh, please, uh, please read the question in the chat box. Uh, Dr. Sami is in the. Uh, well, Sami, uh, do you hear us? No, no. You, you just no. read the. You read the question in the chat box. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sir. So, Sabi, disconnect the audio and uh, directly speak to the device. Doctor Arif, Arif, uh, read his question in the chat box. Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, sir. There was lots of question has been already discussed. Uh, Doctor A B M Riaz Kaur sir wanted to know to the equivalence of concentric L B S versus hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. How they can differentiate? actually this is the out of topics but i am talking right, it is very important very important his talk is question is the concentric lb hypertrophy and asymmetric yeah right, asymmetric yes only difference is the lb cavity 
important ito in concentric hypertrophy secondary to pulmonary stenosis or or the coarctation of the aorta or hypertension there will be thickness of the lv myocardium but the internal dimension of the lv will be within normal level. but in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy the cavity will be compromised and there will be asymmetric hypertrophy and at the, there is a characteristic speckled the appearance of the myocardium that will make you differentiate the things and usually the posterior wall in most of the cases remains spared of hypertrophy in case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy so these are the important point to revise we were asking about the 2d characteristics yes right sir 2d characteristics okay thank you sir uh, dr md sharifuddin he wanted to know how to differentiate aortic sclerosis from mild aortic stenosis aortic sclerosis from mild aortic stenosis okay it's it on very confusing concept uh, while being asked i have shown you the aortic valve velocity is so long 2.5 actually a 2.5 it means gradient wise it is the peak gradient is 25 and it in stenosis it shape like an pyramid and we find out the mean gradient it will be less than 10 so so long mean gradient is less than 10 and the velocity is less than 2.5 and the uh, and the pathological process is sclerotic then it is the sclerosis normal sclerosis but once the valve limit the uh, cross the limit of 2.5 and mean gradient more than 10 mm then you have to level ill uh, level is as an specific aortic valve disease mild moderate severe uh, can i add something there just sir, 30 seconds yes it's a very only 30 seconds evolving concept i think i need yes, comment from <laughs> okay yes sir uh, what have what have explained by jaman is pretty fine huh? only one thing i have to add is please try to differentiate the uh, the definition of stenosis and sclerosis stenosis is a physiological term and sclerosis is an anatomical term so the question should be like this what will be the difference between the thickness of the aortic sclerosis and a rheumatic uh, sclerosis that should have been done so this is an idea if you say the when you say aortic sclerosis actually we define the morphology and this when the morphology can be indistinguishable then we can come to the second part that a physiology what is the gradient that is because of what is the stenotic severity of both the group so morphologically we must differentiate first try to differentiate first between the sclerotic uh, aortic valve lesion and rheumatic or other aortic valve lesion there sort of other also not only rheumatic there are other other also so try to differentiate between first between morphologically between the sclerosis and other things and other explanation already given by jaman i am, I am already a good agree with him thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir sir uh, uh, you question about the pure aortic stenosis in the absence of other valve only 2% so it's very rare dr rumi alam do you hear me probably he is on duty okay or no, pp no, no, no. oh, okay sir one patient selected for ptmc but transitive visual echo showed ala thrombus then when this patient will again advise for ptmc and how the follow up should be done actually in this scenario if the valve morphology is suitable for ptmc then we put the patient with anticoagulant and we at least see for 6 weeks for resolution of the thrombus then we do again the echo and see whether the, or is the condition of the thrombus if it get resoluted then we go for ptmc If it, if it does not, then we uh, think other way according to this uh, according to the that condition of the patients. Uh, Khalid Bhutia said, "Do you add something? This uh, new uh, recent guideline shows the eleven days thrombus. When do the PTMC?" It it depends. Actually, the morphology of the thrombus is also needs to be taken into consideration. Sometimes. Uh, if there is a an urgency of uh, uh, the procedure and the, the thrombus is, now. is well organized you can get away from i think there. i think it sometimes it takes very long to dissolve a thrombus 
Right. And uh, I think uh, whenever there is an organized thrombus, uh, if the if the anticoagulation, we know that the patients are sometimes not taking the proper dose of anticoagulant. The INR report is sometimes erratic. Uh, in these situations, if the subsequent echo shows a well-organized thrombus, one can attempt a PTMC with caution. Uh, uh, because if there is no thr fresh thrombus or if there is the mobility, if the thrombus is well-organized, you can attempt it. Uh, I have a question to Kaviruddhaman Bhai. In some echo reports, we find the, the pulmonary hypertension is commented on the basis of pulmonary artery system. And it causes a lot of anxiety to the patients and their relatives. But we all know that the pulmonary hypertension is a measurement of the mean pressure of the pulmonary artery. I want your comment about it regarding the, on, on the basis of pulmonary hypertension, particularly the mild pulmonary hypertension. Okay. And in so, pregnancy, uh, the no, does the normal velocity and gradient apply for pregnancy or there is any different uh, parameters for assessing the pregnant patients? Actually, your question is the PSP and the mean gradient, like this? Yes. Mean, mean PSP, gradient of that. PA pressure basis on, uh, on mild pulmonary hypertension, comment on the basis of only systolic pressure, systolic pressure. Uh, yes. Is or it, mean is, pressure, mean or systolic? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. There, there, there is some... You can also comment on the basis of the PA mean pressure and also on the peak systolic pressure. And I have shown the uh, normal, uh, the range of the PA, PSP that indicate mild, moderate, severe. Actually up to 40, it is less than 40, it is normal. Less than 40 millimeter mercury of PSP is normal pressure. But PSP from 40 to 50 mile, 50 to 60, it is the moderate. More than 60, it is severe. Okay. And regarding in pregnancy, the, the gradients and the pressure in pregnancy, does it uh, reflect actually, the normal? Actually, actually uh, I think the same parameter. If anybody can add it, but then they can. Dr. Dr. Mishka, sir. Dr. Mishka, sir, with her. One of the. Yes. The, yeah. Uh, you can add something according to the pulmonary hypertension. Yes, I, uh, I want to add something that uh, in nowadays, Doppler echocardiographic assessment of pulmonary artery pressure is not that authentic because you need to clarify through cardiac catheterization. Once, once the velocity of the tricuspid regurgitant is more than 2.8, which makes it, 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 make, it falls into, uh, into a sus suspected zone, tricuspid gradient of more than 2.8. And if it is more than 3.5, then probably by echocardiography, you are sure that you're dealing with the case of pulmonary hypertension. One common mistake that is being seen in the practice that we add 10 with this tricuspid gradient, which makes one to make a comment of pulmonary hypertension. Actually, we should try to add the right atrial pressure along with the tricuspid gradient. And in that case, probably many of the cases will not fall in the range of pulmonary hypertension. But if, if it is more than 2.8, and if, if there is clinical suspicion, it is strongly advised we should not rely on Doppler nowadays. And the parameters in pregnancy are same as it is for the normal population. For pregnancy, although there is hypertension. Actually, I want to add that uh, I want to add with Mishka. Yes, sir. Actually, it is the clinical scenario that is important. <coughs> If you're dealing with the severe mitral stenosis, then obviously there should have some rise in the pulmonary pressure. Should rise. Then okay. obviously you can decide. If anybody could comment to you that severe uh, mitral stenosis, normal peer pressure, will you rely it or you will not rely it? The clinical scenario is important in correlating all the parameters. <coughs> yes, Meshkat Bhai, what he have said it is true. Only what there is doubt. If even there is incomplete TR regurgitant jet, there is you cannot profile the trace the upper margin of the TR jet, then and you have very high suspicion that the RB behavior uh, showing the features of the pressure overload. You are thinking uh, there's severe pulmonary hypertension, but you are not catching with Doppler echo, then you can go for Kepler. You can go. But I think in the absence of all 
uh, organic stenosis, RB hypertrophy with features of pressure low overload, then he, one can easily comment that there is significant pulmonary artery pressure leading to pressure hypertrophy on RB, pressure overload on RB. It, other ancillary tests should be evaluated for better care. This should be clear. Comment. Yes, yes, you're right. But probably we were talking about general uh, general population, general, yeah, yeah. general people. But as regard mitral stenosis, when, when the pulmonary hypertension come into the question, we really need the cutoff value for cardiac surgery. Any anything which is helpful for the intervention list should be should be uh, demarcated because pulmonary hypertension is a, one of the important deciding point in when when we refer a patient for intervention. And in that case, we really need to estimate the cutoff value. Uh, and uh, nowadays, uh, exercise echo is available, bicycle echo is available at BSMMU. Uh, I, I would suggest many of our colleagues to please use this method for evaluation of valvular, uh, valvular patient who, who are candidate for surgery. We can do this semi supine exercise and can estimate the pulmonary pressure, and then thus we can help the patient. Can I add something? Yes, sir. Yes. If, if a mitral stenosis valve is suitable for PTNC, it's irrelevant what is the pulmonary hypertension level because there is no uh, negative point in whatever how severe the pulmonary hypertension is. If you do, you can do the PTNC. The pressure will come down. Yes, this was yes. this. But for surgery, what Mr. Thai was saying, if you want to go for surgery you have to be careful because the patient has to undergo open heart surgery, the NST has to be given, and if the RV dysfunction is there, the chance of revival is uh, very problematic. Thank you, and sir. the mortality, power of heart mortality is higher. Uh, Professor Shabuddin, sir. Professor Mahmoud sir, do you comment? Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Professor Shabuddin, for Vadut uh, Chaudhuri and Dr. Mohsin for arranging uh, such interactive program. And uh, I try to uh, uh, join every single program of uh, your, uh, uh, hosted by your uh, team, because uh, it gives me uh, uh, to attain some uh, knowledge. Some, I, I gain some knowledge and I replace my knowledge. So I consider you, this is a very uh, good program and uh, uh, consider again. And, uh, Regarding Professor uh, uh, Kobiru Jaman, he's my friend, he was my course mate. Uh, he's a very uh, oh, learned, learned person, welcome Islam. Uh, one thing, uh, Dr. Wadud uh, introduced uh, him. Actually, I want to uh, say for the juniors that uh, sometimes we have to go against the current. I'm a subsumer, 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 I'm a and uh, Dr. Kabru Jaman, the consul of Pelo Escorte, Java Journal, you have to close to Lam, Amasin Talakolo, the Kijabo Kijabona. At that time, there was a craze to learn the interventions, angiogram, angioplasty, like this. At that time, uh, uh, he went there uh, uh, against the current, and that's why to, uh, he's today in his positions. And I think he is the only person, there are a lot of legends in our country, uh, Professor Nurul Sar, uh, Chodri Meskar, with due respect to them. I must say that with a structural organized course, uh, with a two years long program, they're much expertise in this subject. And that's why today, not okay, only he's famous, not only he's famous, he's contributing to the country. So I have no other comments. Uh, I had a few questions, but I think these are not at the time. Uh, uh, most of the questions are asked already. Just ask one question I want to ask. During atrial fibrillation, uh, in case of mitral stenosis, if we want to measure by pressure half time uh, the severity, uh, then uh, there is a diastolic variation in the duration, the width of the uh, 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 flow. Which uh, one should we take? Uh, is there any difference between the narrow and wide uh, complex? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Best recommendation by Tajik. He advocates the highest velocity. Highest gradient should be taken. And another way, you have to average five to ten bits. And obviously, you can measure the mitral valve. These are the ways to decide the severity of the mitral valve. Actually, 
in the setup of mitral stenosis, whenever there is atrial fibrillation, the atrial fibrillation is an indication for intervention. Thank you, sir. Professor okay. Jalal, sir. Professor Mama Jalaluddin, sir. Few comments, sir. Thank you, Dr. Motion. Uh, Professor Kobir Zaman. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Professor Kobir Zaman described echocardiography of valvular disease in so widely uh, descriptive method, which I never heard beforehand. I have. It is easy to diagnose the valvular disease by echocardiography, but to assess the severity and consequences of the valve accurately, we have to see so many things. Today I have observed by the description of Professor Kobiru Jaman. So many things to be studied in by echocardiography to assess the actual diagnosis and do the proper treatment. We have had few new things today. One is Vena contractor, which I have never heard beforehand. And how, what is the value of this? I think we can know it in another lecture. The Vena contractor, PISA method, and to diagnose the valvular disease. Then another thing which I have in my long practice, I have not yet seen the supravalvular structure in mitral stonesis, whereas the mitral valve is valve pass is normal. And I'm very happy that at least he has shown one case like this. Another thing, the assessment of pressure gradient in severe aortic stenosis by catheter method. I think it is a bit risky method. Uh, in severe aortic stenosis, it is very difficult to push the uh, catheter, that is, a pitial catheter into the uh, LV. Sometimes arrhythmia occurs. And another thing that the, when you push the catheter into the LV, in severe aortic stenosis, the catheter itself occupies some area in the um, uh, aortic valve opening. In that case, the assessment of the valve pressure gradient becomes difficult with catheter inside the uh, LV and when it is outside the LV. Because when the catheter is inside the LV, it occupies some area in the aortic valve opening. In that case, the pressure will be, systolic pressure will be high. And when you, uh, you sort of bring out the catheter into the aorta, then the pressure may be a little bit low. So in that case, the in severe aortic stenosis, catheter measurement of the aortic valve gradient is difficult to assess. So thank you very much, Professor Kaviru Javan, to describe so many things in uh, echocardiography to diagnose and assess the treatment of valvular disease. Thank you, thank sir. You, thank you, Professor Kobiru Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, we already we already left two and a half hours nearly. Uh, Wadu, sir, please few comments. Please unmute, unmute, sir. Sorry, uh, I think everybody enjoyed it. It was the. Yeah, Mr. Thai Pali. Pali, Mr. Thai Pali, sir. Mr. Thai Pali. ভাগ্যটা কিন্তু এই প্রজন্ম আমার মনে হয় শুধুমাত্র ডেডিকেট খুব ডেডিকেটেড দেখো কাটিগ্রাম তো কবির জামান অলমোস্ট আমার একদিনেরও ট্রেনিং নাই সেজন্য একটু নিয়ে কথা বলতে আমার একটু অস্বস্তি লাগে একটা পয়েন্ট একটু বলতে চাই আর কি সেটা হলো যে 
as regard the uh, uh, labyrinth outflow track measurement in this, which is so important because uh, we we think about echocardiography when we make judgment about the severity of some disease the, uh, for judgment whether the patient is a potential candidate for surgery or intervention and in that case uh, the measurement actual measurement of the valve area is so important this is the gold standard always the planimetric measurement which we do not get in case of uh, aortic valve but in that case we have continuity equation by using continuity equation we try to uh, measure the valve area but the tricky point in measurement echocardiographic measurement is the labyrinth flow outflow track at the times we zoom the image of the labyrinth flow outflow track and we try to make the measurement but still we assume that the labyrinthal outflow tract is circular, is cylindrical, which is not the case in many of the cases. So if we aid the CT, CT in that case, CT measurement of the labyrinthal outflow tract, and then integrate the Doppler velocity, then probably it can give better measurement of the uh, aortic valve. This is the point I had to say. Transistive vision and three-dimensional echocardiography, how mitral valve looks in three-dimensional echocardiography. Possibly, there are two indications of transthoracic three-dimensional echocardiography. One is the measurement of the left ventricular systolic function, and the second one is mitral valve. We, we used to use a lot of uh, three-dimensional echocardiography, uh, especially for the use of our uh, student who had some research purpose. Uh, the true, true utility of three-dimensional echocardiography in those cases were to assess the morphology of the commissure. At the times, the commissure, which is, seems calcified in the two-dimensional echocardiography, which is a very vital point while you are doing PTMC. But in three-dimensional echocardiography, we used to find that in some cases, the calcification is not in the commissure. It, it, it is at elsewhere. As regard measure, measuring the valvular area, three-dimensional and two-dimensional echocardiography, the planimetric estimation do not really differ in an in a expert hand. What you get in two-dimensional echocardiography, most of the cases, it, it, it agrees with the three-dimensional echocardiography. As regard transistive vagal echocardiography, we used to do a lot of transistive vagal echocardiography in patients with mitral stenosis. And in that time, we, we didn't have any three-dimensional echocardiography. And we used to do transgastric echocardiography to see the planimetric assessment of the mitral valve, which was not that, that, uh, that necessary at that time, of course. Sorry to... Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Your nice comment, sir. Thank you, sir. What is sir? Thank you, everybody, for listening to the irritated lecture of Professor Kobe Jaman. We really enjoyed it. And I hope as the recording will be available in YouTube, so everybody can enjoy at their own time the whole lecture. And he has mentioned that many of the slides he has just lost over, but it will be in record so that you can at your own pace and rhythm, understand and ingest what he is saying. And in future, prepare all those questions that comes to your mind. Keep put it in writing. Uh, give it to us. We will be asking back him again to answer your all those questions. And Professor Kovichaman Bhai, it's really, we are really grateful for your beautiful lecture. We enjoyed it. Our senior teacher, Nudul sir, Jalal sir, our, my senior brother, Nishkar Bhai, Shafiuddin Bhai, all are here. We have all enjoyed it. We, Thank you. From IPDI, we are really grateful to all of you. And Pinsepta, of course, again and again, to Shorov and his team, Dr. Sajil and his team, we are really grateful to you for arranging the platform on which we can execute our educational plan. Mosin and Shajal. Mosin is the, actually the heart. And the Shajal is the workhorse. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Kuru Yazar. Thank you, sir, everybody, sir. I'm very aware yes. that our senior professor, Professor Abrusun, sir, is now in critical. Uh, we pray for his early recovery. And I thanks Professor Jalal, sir, Professor. Uh, Mr. Ahmed, Professor, Professor Wadud, everybody. The next lecture table again, sir. Uh, I think uh, our next lecture on 17th July, on Friday, I hope it is my first class in my life. Basic hemodynamics for cat lab. 
uh, I used to go in the cath lab last 15 years or 20 years, but nobody talks about it. So, Good. Professor Dr. Sundi Mishra, Professor of Department of Cardiology, Ames, New Delhi, India. He is the ex editor of the Indian Heart Journal. I think we are waiting on 17th July, Friday at 7 30 p.m. Till then, everybody take care. Uh, can, I, can I add something? Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Professor Shondeep will be taking a quiz also. So I'll be asking all the students, uh, go through your books a little bit so that you can understand his lecture. He's a very learned person. I have met him in Nepal, have taken exam. I have a examiner with him in the MD cardiology. And it's very, it's going to be a learning experience for all of us. So if we go through a little bit uh, beforehand, we can be prepared more to accept what he's giving us and I said I ask, I'm asking everybody to uh, take part in the quiz at that time thanks everybody sure sir Allah peace assalamu alaikum thank you sir 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 Thank you. Later. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. you, sir. We'll be waiting. Assalamu alaikum, sir.